King of kings and Lord of lords, glory, alleluia. King of kings and Lord of lords, glory, alleluia. Jesus, Prince of peace, glory, alleluia. Jesus, Prince of peace, glory, alleluia. King of kings and Lord of lords, glory, alleluia. Hello, my name is Mark Syme. I am the minister of the Northfield Church of Christ in Northfield, New Jersey. I would like to take this opportunity to welcome you to our evening services for Sunday, May the 14th. And to all you mothers out there, happy Mother's Day. I hope you have a wonderful day. We will sing several songs, observe the Lord's Supper, and then I have a message for you that uh, hopefully will be useful and uh, uplifting to us. We sing here at Northfield from Songs of Faith and Praise. I will give you the number of the song in our songbook. I'll also give you the name of the song. So if you do want to sing along and you don't have this book, uh, you can Google it. Or if you have another book, uh, hopefully it's in there. The first song we will sing is number 722. The title of the song is Let the beauty of Jesus be seen. Let the beauty of Jesus be seen. Number 722. <clears throat> Let the beauty of Jesus be seen in me. All is wonderful passion and purity. May his spirit divine all my being refine. Let the beauty of Jesus be seen in me. When somebody has been so unkind to you, some word spoken that pierces you through and through. Think how he was beguiled, spat upon and reviled. Let the beauty of Jesus be seen in you. From the dawn of the morning till close of day, in example, in deeds, and in all you say, lay your gifts at his feet, every me be sweet. Let the beauty of Jesus be seen in you. Our next song is 183. Lord of all being, throned afar. 183. Lord of all being, be thrown afar. The words are by Oliver Wendell Holmes. One eighty three. <clears throat> Lord of all being, throned afar, thy glory flames from sun and star. Center and soul of every sphere, yet to each loving heart how near. Son of our life, thy quickening ray sheds on our path the glow of day. Star of our hope, thy soft and light cheers the long watches of the night. 
Our midnight is by smile withdrawn. Our noontide is thy gracious dawn. Our rainbow watch thy mercy sign. All save the clouds of sin are mine. And before we partake of the Lord's Supper, uh, number 335 in memory of the Savior's love. 335 in memory of the Savior's love. In memory of the Savior's love, we keep the sacred feast. Where every humble, contrite heart is made a welcome guest. By faith we take the bread of life with which our souls are fed. The cup in token of his blood that was for sinners shed. Beneath this banner, thus we sing the wonders of His love. And here anticipate by faith the heavenly feast above. We now do as we are commanded to do on every first day of the week, and that is to gather about his table. We are told that in the scripture, it is the first day of the week that we are to do that. And uh, we just hope that uh, on this first day of the week that uh, we are uh, gathered together uh, for all the right reasons. And there are many reasons, but now we are going to center on the Lord's Supper, which he instituted on the night in which he was betrayed. And we know that uh, when uh, the Passover was celebrated, uh, he talked about the bread, which would represent his body and the fruit of the vine that was uh, representative of his blood. Uh, he talked about that he would give up his body, that he would shed his blood. And so as we gather about the table, we uh, do it with solemnity. We do it with love. We do it with the realization that Jesus uh, uh, not only came to earth as the master teacher, but became the perfect sacrifice uh, for each one of us, that through him we might live again. Let's pray for the bread. Our most gracious God, we come before you right now as we gather about the table of your son. We think of that dark betrayal night. We think of what he went through. We think of the mocking and the scourging, uh, especially by his own people who rejected him. We pray to Heavenly Father that we would, that we would hold Jesus so closely to us and remember that he gave himself up for us. As we partake of this bread, we think of his body that suffered on the cross. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. As the song we just sang said, uh, the fruit of the vine, uh, the cup is in token of his blood that was for sinners shed. That's you and I. Jesus shed his innocent blood 
because he came into a world of sin and he did his best to explain to people what they should do about that sin. We, through the blood of Jesus, have our sins washed away. Let's give thanks for the fruit of the vine. We know, dear God, that we're empty without the blood that Jesus shed for us. We understand that your grace is poured upon us as the life-giving blood flowed from Jesus' body. We pray, dear Heavenly Father, that we would come to understand and come to appreciate the magnitude of his sacrifice and the shedding of his blood. We pray this in his most holy name. Amen. With the Lord's Supper being completed, we are also reminded that on the first day of the week, uh, we are also to lay by in store and give as we have prospered. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, uh, the very beginning of the chapter, explains that to us. Uh, that uh, the monies very often that were given were given so that the needy would be helped. The monies were given so that more people could come to Christ. And so as we give back to the Lord, remember we're giving back uh, what is his anyway. And we're giving back uh, with hopefully cheerfulness as we understand that uh, our Lord loves a cheerful giver. Be with us in our giving and help us to purpose in our giving, to give back. Be with those that uh, use this money, that it will be used in the proper way. Let's pray. We're grateful to Heavenly Father that we have both the desire and opportunity to give. Help us to give with a cheerful and open heart. Help us that our monies may be representative of that with which we have prospered. Bless us, dear Heavenly Father, as we give and help the church that it might be the vehicle here on earth that is to do your will in all things. Bless us in our giving, we pray it in his most holy name. Amen. The last song that we'll sing is number 991. 991, the title of the song is, This is My Father's World. This is My Father's World, 991. <clears throat> this is my father's world. And to my listening ears, all nature sings and round me rings the music of the spheres. This is my father's world. I rest me in the thought. Of rocks and trees, of skies and seas, is and the wonders wrought. This is my father's world. The birds their carols raise. The morning light, the lily white, declare their Maker's praise. This is my Father's world. I shine in all that's fair. In the rustling grass I hear him pass. He speaks to me everywhere. This is my father's world. Oh, let me ne'er forget. Though, though the wrong seems of so strong, God is the ruler yet. This is my father's world. The battle is not done. 
Jesus, who died, shall be satisfied, and earth and heaven be one. I hope you enjoyed singing as much as I did. And I just hope that um, in uh, the song, we have praised the Lord as he is certainly worthy of that praise. Uh, if you were uh, in attendance this morning, uh, you ho heard that uh, the uh, lesson this evening would be about fire. And I, I kind of have tweaked that a little bit. And it is about fire slash love. Now, do those do those two things seem to be at opposite ends of the spectrum? Fire and love? Seemingly on the surface. But I, I want us uh, to look at a couple of things this evening and uh, see where I'm coming from when I talk about this. The text of the lesson comes from Song of Solomon. Okay, Song of Solomon. Chapter 8, verses 6 and 7. Song of Solomon, chapter 6, uh, chapter 8, verses 6 to 7. When you hear this passage, you'll understand um, the perspective from which I am coming when I say the message is about fire slash love. Okay, listen to these words. For love is as strong as death, jealousy as cruel as the grave. Its flames are flames of fire, a most vehement flame. Many waters cannot quench love, nor can the floods drown it out. If a man would give, if a man would give for love all the wealth of his house, it would be utterly despised. Those are pretty powerful words about love, aren't they? It equates love and death. It, it uh, talks about a flame uh, of fire when it talks about love, uh, a flame of fire that is vehement, that cannot be quenched. Now, you know what? ad nauseum, you have heard sermons preached by preachers about love. And they have dragged out, I say dragged out, I'm sorry, I shouldn't do that because I've done that myself. Uh, all of the Greek terms for love. We know the storge and we know the phileo and we know that really, really important love uh, uh, of course, I forgot about Eros, uh, that really, really important love called agape love, the most powerful of all loves. However, what I am going to talk about this evening is that love can be a dangerous thing. There are a lot of things out there in this world that we like that can be dangerous things. Think about that uh, for a moment. Uh, some of the things that we do, um, uh, some of the, uh, when we were young, some of the chances that we took that we should not have taken. Uh, and part of the reason was that we took the chances because there was a certain intrigue in it. And some of the chances involved danger. You ever wonder why someone jumps out of an airplane and skydives? <laughs> uh, if something goes wrong, death is inevitable. There was a, a story about a man just, at, uh, as a matter of fact, it was here in New Jersey, uh, that had done 700 successful skydives and somewhere around 700 and I don't know how many. He died skydiving. Now, I'm not saying that uh, skydiving will lead ultimately to death. But when we do that, it's part of the thrill. 
not the thrill that we think that we might die, but the thrill that's involved in the sensation. But along with the sensation comes the danger. And so that being said, what I'm saying to you this evening is, is that love can be a dangerous thing. It's the most powerful character force that we know. And it leaves nothing unchanged. For, for better or for worse, love shapes our character. And with that, it determines our destiny. We are told that the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. That is the most powerful thing that we are to do. It was the first commandment back when the commandments were given and it was still the first commandment as uttered by Jesus to us. And so what love will do is it will either live up, lead us to heaven or if improperly applied, it would drag us to hell. We may be through our love move toward God or through our love of improper things driven to almost uh, a miserable exile. But make sure that we understand one thing. Love will never leave us exactly where we are. Love will never leave us exactly where we are. What do I mean by that? Well, I think perhaps there are two things that determine what love will do for us and to us. One, and think about this for a minute. <clears throat> One is the choice we make as to what we love. Now, again, we can throw love around in many, many ways. You know, I love ice cream or I love chocolate. I, I love the smell of a new car. <laughs> However, what is the object of our love? I may love ice cream and my, I may love chocolate, but that love will not get me to heaven. My love must be of a higher degree than that. If we focus our love on God and toward our fellow human beings, love becomes a good thing. Love is a purification thing. Love, when focused in the proper direction, will purify us. However, if, if we go the other direction, if we allow our love to settle upon either ourselves or merely the material things of creation, then that love will destroy us. Hmm. Isn't that, isn't that an interesting dichotomy? The same love that can save us and bring us into a wonderful relationship with the Lord, when used improperly, will destroy us. For example, we know where money comes into this equation. In James chapter 5, and verse 3, he says, Your gold and silver are corroded, and their corrosion will be a witness against you, and will eat your flesh like fire. There's that fire again. 
The same unquenchable fire that Solomon talked about in Song of Solomon, chapter 8, verses 6 and 7. Love is as strong as death, a vehement fire. James is talking about the same thing. Your silver and gold are corroded, and their corrosion will be a witness against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You know what? Fire is a good thing, isn't it? Fire is a good thing. Fire warms us when we're cold. However, fire can bless us or blight us, depending upon whether the objects of our love are higher or lower. If they are higher, our love will purify us. If they're lower, our love will be damnable to us. But then there's something else here. Our motives for love are critical. For example, if we love simply for what we are going to get in return, love will turn out to be a destructive force. But if we learn to love for what love can give, the outcome will be radically different. For example, a few moments ago, <clears throat> as part of our service, we talked about giving back to the Lord. In Acts chapter 20 and verse 35, the Holy Spirit inspired scriptures tell us it is more blessed to give than to receive. And this is the difference in motive. We can't just be receivers all of our life. We have to be givers, especially when it comes to God. This is in motive decisive, especially when it comes to God. The love of God has a positive effect only when we give our love to him and for his own sake. We love God for the sake of God because he is our creator. He is the image in which we are spiritually created. Whatever benefits we receive, our love for God must run deeper than those blessings. Because we're not guaranteed blessings. As a matter of fact, in some cases, James talks about blessed are those who persevere when they are in hardship. Because we learn just as much from hardship as we learn from blessedness. We must not love God for what we can get from him. We must love God. We must love God because our desire to be close to him is so powerful. Now, with that, do we pray for blessings? Of course we do. Do we pray for those that are sick to uh, be given their health back? Of course we do. If we didn't, we wouldn't have a relationship with God. And so with that, as we get to the end of this lesson this evening, let's be careful. Let's be very, very, very careful about what we love and about why we love. You know, God gave us the freedom that we like to call free will. 
Getting to choose is a part of the glory of God as personal beings. Because God puts himself out there and he says, I'm the one that you are to choose. I'm the one toward whom you are to direct your love. We are made in the image of God. And God is love. And you know, that's so very, very important. If we are made in the image of God, and God is love, what are we to be all about? We're made in the image of God, who is perfect love. And we flourish when we love him in the right way. On the other side of the coin, if we fail to love him in the right way, it may be that we still know some sort of love, but that love will become our undoing. <sighs> Lastly, love is the fire of life. It either consumes us or it purifies us. We need to make sure that the love that is in us is the love of purification when the love is directed toward the God of our universe who is love. And so let's look at these scriptures. Let's look at Song of Solomon 8, 6 and 7. Let's look at James chapter 5 and verse 3. Let's look at Acts chapter 20, verse 35, and see the positive effect that love ought to have in our life. Let it be a fire. It's okay. Because we know that fire can purify. And we want to be purified by the love of God. Part of why we're purified by the love of God is because God desires us to be his children. He wants us to be a part of his kingdom here on earth. And he sets apart in his scriptures the way that we do so. It started on the day of Pentecost in the second chapter of Acts, where the people who were touched in their hearts said, what shall we do? And Peter said, Arise and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. We are told that we are to confess Jesus as the Son of God. We are to love him with all of our heart. We are to say about the things that we've done wrong in the past. We're sorry for those and we want to repent of those and finally be baptized for the remission of our sins so that we may receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. If you haven't done that and that is what you know that you need to do. The offering is for you this evening. If it's immediate in nature, get in touch with us, with one of us. We will be there for you. Let's close with a prayer. Our God and Heavenly Father, we're grateful for the great love that God had for us, that while we were yet sinners, he died for us. We know that Jesus came into a world of sin, and we know that through his body and through his blood that our sins are forgiven. Bless us, dear Heavenly Father. Help us to be your children and help us, dear Heavenly Father, to do what we need to do to stay within your love. Help us to have that love that purifies. Bless us in our love. Bless us, dear Heavenly Father, as we attempt to do your will. We pray this in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. Please be safe and may God bless you all. Kings and Lord of Lords, glory. Alleluia. King of kings and Lord of Lords, glory. Alleluia. Jesus, Prince of Peace, glory. Alleluia. Jesus, Prince of Peace, glory. Alleluia. King of kings and Lord.